Okay, I hope uh, everyone can hear me. Um, my name is Ian Metzler. I'm the current fellow um, in Indo-Urology at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I have the pleasure to introduce Jonathan Harper, uh, who's the Chief of Indo-Urology, my fellowship director. Uh, he's gonna talk to you today about uh, stone prevention, uh, which we do a lot uh, in fellowship as part of our Kidney Stone Center. Um, and I'll let him take it away. Okay, uh, great. So thanks, Dan, for the introduction. Um, I just am happy to, to be able to take part in this, what seems like a really great educational initiative. Um, so hopefully everyone is getting, getting something good out of this during these kind of these strange times that we're in right now. So I have uh, no disclosures. So as an overview, the, the talk will really be, um, the framework will be the AUA medical management of uh, kidney stone um, guidelines, statements in regards to evaluation. So there's seven evaluation statements. We'll cover six of those seven. And then just really briefly talk about 24-hour urine and supersaturation. And then kind of the, the bulk of the talk will we'll really delve into dietary management. There's um, six dietary management guideline statements by the AUA. Um, one has to do with cysting area. We're not going to cover that today, but we'll, we'll cover the other five. Uh, and then end with a discussion about a clinical trial on prevention that's ongoing that really kind of ties into to what we'll, we'll be talking about. And so what is the approach to stone formers? Um, you know, who should get a workup and what is that workup and whether that's a screening evaluation or whether it's a complete evaluation. And whenever, whenever you see a, a rectangle here, this kind of indicates a, a AUA guideline statement. And so it says that really everyone with a newly diagnosed stone should undergo a screening evaluation. And what does that screening evaluation consist of? Well, it's a focused medical and dietary history, which we'll talk about, some blood work, a UA, and then another guideline statement says, if there is a stone to analyze, we should do this at least once. And, and really for the most part, you know, patients are always thinking that that is the holy grail, but we're really just trying to rule out a, a rare stone such as uric acid or a cysteine stone or something like that. And so as far as the screening evaluation, when we think about, you know, what do we, what do we really want to ask? And when we're looking at their medical history, we're trying to group patients into kind of a high-risk category. And so, you know, have they had a malabsorptive bariatric surgery, such as Roux and Y? Um, do they have inflammatory bowel disease, you know, Crohn's disease? Do they have gout? Things that are going to put them at a higher risk for developing uh, recurrent stones. So we want to kind of screen through to look at that. Um, and then look at their medications. And I highlight topiramate because it's, it's such a commonly used medication uh, for a lot of different things, but it really increases stone risk. It can change the urine parameters to kind of mimic a renal tubular acidosis with severe hypocitraturia, high urine pH. And then I think you should always ask about uh, supplements. Uh, well, specifically, do you take vitamin C, do you take vitamin D, and do you take calcium? As far as the screening evaluation for diet, I mean, you can go down the rabbit hole as kind of talking about diet, but you know, if you want to, you want to kind of kind of screen someone to get a sense of what they're doing as far as their their fluid intake and and what they eat, and and it may just be a few questions. I I, I will often ask a patient, "Are you a water drinker?" Because you'll be really surprised when people say, "Oh gosh, I I hate water." So then you just ask them, "Okay, what do you drink?" Um, you might ask them about. You know, do you eat out a lot or buy uh, packaged meals? That, 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 might, that might indicate a high salt diet. Are they on any fad diet, which a lot of those are really high animal protein? Um, and just do you eat fruits and vegetables? Okay, so as far as the, the blood work, the, really you want a BMP. You want a BMP for a few reasons we'll talk about, and a uric acid. And I, I, I will admit I don't always have a patient go back to the lab for a uric acid if, if they have really no risk factors and they have a BMP. But in, in, if you're sending one for, for blood work, a uric acid is recommended along with a BMP. Now, a PTH actually, this is the guideline statement that says that we should get a PTH if primary hyperparathyroidism is suspected. Um, I know some people's clinical practice is to kind of do this big blanket approach, get a PTH and everyone, a vitamin D, et cetera. But this is what the guideline statement says. Um, so why would we suspect primary hyperparathyroidism? 
Well, the first would be hypercalcemia. Someone has hypercalcemia, you need to be getting a PTH. But other things may be, they may have a, a high normal serum calcium, but maybe they have calcium phosphate stones too, um, or maybe they have nephrocalcinosis and a high normal serum calcium. These are things that might drive me to order a PTH and vitamin D, kind of look a little bit further. Other things that we want to look at with the BMP and it, are, do they have metabolic acidosis? Metabolic acidosis is associated with hypocitraturia. Um, they may have renal tubular acidosis, which you can um, identify or at least be suspicious for with hypokalemia, hyperchloremia, metabolic acidosis. Um, so you don't want to fall kind of into the kind of the, the lull of, of when, when seeing a patient and being asked, do they have screening evaluation labs and say, yeah, their, their kidney function's normal. I, see, I hear this a lot. We kind of are, are forgetting that like we can get a lot of information potentially by looking at the electrolytes and the things like we're talking about. And then if you do have a uric acid and they have hyperuricemia, you know, gout is a risk factor for stones. Uh, so that can help you. Maybe you're gonna use allopurinol at one point for stone prevention. And as far as the urine, so really what we're looking at with the urine is, is the pH. You know, if, if, if someone has low urine pH, less than or equal to five or, or 5.5, um, and then you're gonna look at their, their imaging studies, if they have a radiolucent stone, that may be enough for you to assume they have uric acid stones and consider alkalinization therapy. If they have a high urine pH, uh, 6.5, maybe they have calcium phosphate stones. If they have a high urine pH, and infections, maybe they have struvite stones. Okay, so, so that's the screening evaluation all, that all stone formers we should be detailing. Um, there is one guideline statement about imaging. It says that we should obtain and review available imaging studies to quantify stone burden. And this seems obvious if you have an acute patient, they have a ureteral stone, you wanna make sure they, you know, do they have a renal stone on that side? If you're gonna do ureteroscopy, you can treat that stone too. Uh, but if this is a patient who has not had acute event, they're just coming in as a, a new patient, establishing care, um, you want to look at their imaging, their, their prior, whatever imaging is available, because if you see someone, they said, oh, I've only had one stone, but they have 15 stones in their kidneys, that's going to put them in a high-risk category. Maybe they have nephrocalcinosis, or maybe they have some anatomic abnormality that's going to predispose them to additional stone. So, after the, someone has had one stone, I, mean, they, I think people probably still say this. I, when I was training, it, we, we were all told if they have one stone, they get a free pass. Um, so you, know, you don't need to do anything further. If they have another stone, maybe we talk about additional things with stone prevention. But there, there is some evidence that first time stone formers really have a similar metabolic risk factors as recurrent stone formers. And I think this partly drives the guideline statement of who gets additional workup. And so we talked about the screening evaluation. So what about the complete evaluation? The complete evaluation is essentially a 24 hour urine, but this statement says that we should get that in high risk. So defined by what we just did with our screening evaluation. So high risk or interested first time stone formers and then recurrent stone formers. So really almost everyone could be offered a 24-hour urine, but certainly high-risk recurrent stone formers, we should do that. Um, and so when we're ordering the 24-hour urine, uh, the guideline statement says that it can be one or two 24-hour urines on a random diet. And I think the random diet part, I, I really want to emphasize because what it's easy to have, and I've done a 24-hour urine, and I, I, I think I drank more because I kept looking at the jug, but when you, when you ask someone to do a 24-hour urine, they may be saying, I've been trying to drink more uh, fluid for a long, long time. But when they do their 24-hour urine, that's the day they do it. But it doesn't really show you anything about why they formed a stone. And then they're probably not going to do that again the following day. So really try to emphasize to them, just do your normal thing during this 24-hour urine. And the, and the bottom of the slide there talks about what, at a minimum, we should be, what should we, we should be evaluating for. So uh, moving on from evaluation, as far as medical management, I'll first just show a slide. This is a 24-hour urine, or it's one page of, this is, happens to be Litholink, one of the stone labs. Um, but I, I wanted to show this to kind of emphasize, you know, the concept of supersaturation. Um, supersaturation is something that is thought to be a surrogate for future stone formation. 
It's something that you can follow with time to see how people are doing. Um, and this, I showed this particular page because the colors, it kind of helps patients understand a little bit about um, that everything's a continuum is, is what I, I, I like to think of it as because we will have a normal value for say urine calcium and whether that's 200 or 250 is not the point but if it the normal value is 200 or less it's not doesn't mean it's good if you're 199 and bad if you're 201 everything is kind of fluid and it all affects supersaturation you may decrease your sodium and decrease your calcium a little bit but you didn't drink as much water um, and so super saturation is, is something nice that you can kind of follow if you're doing repetitive 24-hour uh, urines and in regards to super saturation for calcium oxalate stones for example these are the these are the main things and low urine volume is affects all uh, stone formation uh, but hypercalciuria hyperoxaluria too little citrate or hyperuricosuria. And you know, remember hyperuricosuria is a risk factor for uric acid stones, but also calcium oxalate stones. It really depends on, on the urine pH. But the dietary guideline statements, which we're gonna start to go into next, there are five guideline statements. One has to do with urine volume, and then there's one for each of these entities here. Okay. So moving on to diet, when I, when I think about diet and talk about diet, I, I, I you know, have this question, you know, is there a kidney stone diet? You know, it, patients, you know, we all would like everything to be easy. And if there was just one thing that we could direct them to, um, maybe that would be beneficial. And so, well, first we'll start with fluid. And so why is fluid intake important? This one is one of the only ones that seems super obvious, but because of super saturation, if you're drinking more fluid, you're making more urine, you're increasing the solution, um, stones are essentially salts that are occurring at too high of the concentration. So the, gui the guideline statement um, is actually um, based on a single trial for the most part, but it states that we should recommend to all stone formers a fluid intake to achieve at least two and a half liters of urine a day. Um, and the, 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 the grade of the evidence is, is a B. So even this is one of the only Two randomized or one of the two randomized controlled trials would, would that have to do with diet. Um, a grade A would be a high quality randomized controlled trial. So this there are some um, some uh, limitations uh, with this trial, but nevertheless, it's it's the evidence that we have for this recommendation. And this is the trial. This is uh, the thought to be you know the Borghi fluid study, an Italian study, uh, published in 1996. Um, and they looked at 199 calcium oxalate stone formers, and they are randomized to high fluid intake for a goal of two liters of urine a day, um, and or they are randomized to just no specific recommendations. So those in the high fluid intake arm, they they did really well, at least based on their 24 hour urine at five years, 2.6 liters on average of urine. Uh, the other group was was really really bad, um, one liter on average. Um, and th so those that were the randomized to a higher fluid intake, made more urine on that 24-hour urine, had a lower stone recurrence. But what type? Is it just water? Can people drink other things? This is a very common question people are going to ask you. Um, so this is a study by Gary Curhan and colleagues. They, they used three large epidemiological cohort studies, the Nurses Health One and, and uh, Two, as well as the Health Professional Follow-Up Studies. They followed, uh, or patients were followed for eight years with no prior stones, and the, the primary outcome was a, an incident stone. And what they found is that if you drank sugar-sweetened drinks, you had an increased risk of developing a stone. But, um, with few exceptions, like we just talked about, really all fluids count, and that includes things like coffee and, and tea and uh, and juice. So, the, I think the for the, the really the take home is we want people to drink fluids and increase urine output. And if we're if we're fixated on telling people it has to be water, and so many patients just don't like water, they may think that well, if if only water helps me, I don't like drinking water. I might as well just not drink you know much of anything. Um, so there are a lot of things you want people to just to drink fluids and avoid kind of sugar-sweetened drinks. Okay, 
So moving on to, to calcium, um, you know, we actually, Ian and I were talking to a patient just yesterday and, and it's, it's, this is, it's not intuitive when you're talking about too much calcium in the urine, but we don't want you to, to reduce your calcium intake. And it, it's really, I, I'm still not sure exactly how to, how to best get that through to patients, but uh, we'll talk about that here and hope that we can all kind of understand why we're telling people uh, what we're telling them. So why is calcium intake important? So dietary calcium controls urine oxalate. Dietary calcium as well as sodium also affect bone mineralization. So if you're restricting your dietary calcium, you're going to increase your oxalate absorption and then you're gonna have more urinary oxalate. If you restrict your dietary calcium, you're gonna lead, to, that's gonna to lead to bone demineralization. Yes, it's true, if you have an excessive intake of calcium, um, that's more of that will end up getting into uh, the urine. Okay, so the other trial that you know, I mentioned, two randomized controlled trials, also by Borgi. This was uh, published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2002. Uh, this was a really important trial because um, they, they looked at dietary calcium, but importantly, they looked at sodium and protein, two additional things that affect uh, stone disease. Um, but their trial, they, for some reason they studied men only, but they studied 120 men. They had, these men had calcium oxalate stones and hypercalciuria. So especially at that time, you may say, these patients need to reduce their calcium. They have calcium oxalate stones and they have too much calcium in their urine. So they were randomized to a low calcium diet, which was about 400 milligrams of calcium, or to a high calcium diet, we kind of say the normal calcium now, but that was around 1200 milligrams of calcium. But again, low sodium, low protein. And so those who are on the low calcium diet, they had more stone recurrence. Unfortunately, we, we don't see the, the independent effect of calcium, protein, and sodium in, the, in the, this trial, just wasn't evaluated. But this tells us pretty strongly that low calcium diet is probably not gonna be a good thing for these patients. If you look at the 24-hour urines in these, in these patients, so remember we were talking about supersaturation. So those patients on the right that ate a high calcium diet, they had lower urine oxalate at end of study. So remember we just said diet calcium controls urine oxalate. They also, despite eating three times the amount of calcium, they actually their urinary calcium actually was similar to the low calcium group. So why could that be? Well, it's because of the low salt, low sodium, and probably low protein too, as we'll talk about uh, later. Okay, so two other uh, mentions about calcium, one about dietary calcium and one about calcium supplements. This is um, a health professional, using the health professional follow-up uh, cohort, uh, over 45,000 men, um, and they looked at dietary calcium and stone incidence. Um, this is published in New England Journal, 1993. And so the referent range was those on that low calcium diet, so less than 600 milligrams. But the, with each quintile above that, including those who ate the, the most amount of dietary calcium, over 1,000 milligrams, all those who had a higher calcium diet had a lower stone uh, risk or, or developed less stones and, and on the order of you know, around 30% or so less um, so eating dietary calcium appears to be a good thing for, for stone formers. Now, calcium supplements, this is, this is one trial, a randomized trial um, with the Women's Health Initiative. So this is a, a study in postmenopausal women, and they are really looking at uh, uh, bone fr fractures. But they randomized patients to taking a gram of calcium in, the, in a pill form with vitamin D versus placebo. And, and those patients who are randomized to taking calcium, they did have a slightly increased risk of bone mineral density, but no decreased risk in fractures, but they had a 17% increased risk of stones who followed for seven years. Uh, there's also a, a, a prospective, a cohort study um, that showed the same thing. Basically pa patients who were taking calcium supplements had about a 20% increased risk of stones. So how much calcium, whether you're a man, a woman, younger, older, it's really about the same. 1,000, 1,200 milligrams is, is kind of what's recommended um, for, for intake. Okay, so moving on to sodium, protein, refined sugar. 
Um, this was my daughter's contribution to the talk. She showed me that you can write on your slides with the, this glitter pen. So this is, this is from her. Um, but I grouped these because they all have an effect on urine calcium. You, you may, you know, we've talked about sodium already. You may say, oh, I know about sodium. What's the deal with this protein or fine sugar? Uh, so we'll talk about that in the next few slides. So why is sodium intake when it comes to stones? Well, dietary sodium, sodium controls urine calcium. Okay, so we were talking earlier about diet calcium controlling urine oxalate. Diet sodium controls urine calcium. So if you're eating a lot of salt, you'll have a lot of sodium in your urine and your urine calcium increases. This has been shown, this is just one study, it's been shown in many studies in men and women. Um, and so the recommendation here is from the CDC is that uh, a low salt diet, which is about two grams, this is what's recommended uh, for stone formers, um, you know, 100 milliequivalents or, or 2,300 milligrams uh, of sodium um, is, is what's recommended. Another thing that's kind of important about sodium is, you know, I'm, we're not going to talk about pharmacologic therapy today, but if you're treating someone with a thiazide and they're eating a high salt diet, it really kind of negates the, the, the efficacy of the, of the medication. So, you know, whether they're, you're managing them with diet alone and saying low salt diet, or whether you've gone on to pharmacologic therapy, still low salt diet is, is really going to be important. And so the guideline statement um, in regards to hypercalciuria uh, is really based on that Borgi trial we talked about earlier. So patients with calcium stones and hypercalciuria should limit their sodium intake, but continue to eat calcium, you know, the normal amount. So we talked about, um, I'd argue that you could also mention protein, sugar in, in a statement for recommendations, but, but this is a, um, the highest quality data that we have. And so they, they stick with sodium and, and dietary calcium here. Okay, so refined sugar. So we mentioned already that Patients who drink sugar-sweetened uh, beverages have an increased risk of stones. This is a study that was in the New England Journal in 1969. And so this was a study that they looked at urine calcium uh, after getting a sugar, before and after getting a sugar load. And so, and these patients were fasting. So there, there's no you know, calcium that's coming from any other source here. And they looked at normal subjects, which were, which were people who had no stones, they looked at calcium stone formers, and they looked at relatives of calcium stone formers. So during a control period, the urine calcium was stable. Those, the stone formers and relatives of stone formers had a higher urine calcium at baseline. But when all these subjects, uh, whether stone formers or not, received a sugar load, you see this transient increase in urinary calcium. Okay, so animal protein. Um, you know, why is animal protein important when it comes to stones? Uh, for one, it's, it's an acid load. You, you might have heard acid ash diet, which is kind of um, we have a high protein diet, but an acid load, what that does is promotes citrate reabsorption or, or, or low, lowers urinary citrate. Again, any, any acidosis is associated with lower urine citrate, citrate being an inhibitor of stones. Um, and so an acid load also will lower urine pH. Any transient acidemia can be associated with, with bone demineralization. You, you might, when you think about animal protein, you might already think about, well, it increases urinary uric acid, which is true. This is kind of the direct effect and, and breakdown of, of, of animal protein and purines. And we talked about hyperuricosuria being a risk factor for both calcium and uric acid stones. Animal protein also affects urinary calcium, which we'll, we'll touch on in just one second. So I'll mention that there's two guideline statements. So we've talked about uh, the one for fluid, we've talked about the one for hypercalciuria. Uh, there's two additional guideline statements that, that have animal protein listed within them. And the first one is what we were just talking about with hyperuricosuria. So this applies to calcium stone formers and uric acid stone formers. But if they have hyperuricosuria, we should limit animal protein. Uh, the next one is in regards to citrate. So this is our guideline statement that, that, that calls out calcium stone formers with hypocitraturia. And so what we should be telling these patients is that they should increase their fruits and vegetables. 
And so why would that be? Well, fruits and vegetables are really provide an alkali load and they should limit their animal protein. Again, the acid load. So kind of limit the acid load, increase the alkali load. And then as I mentioned, the association of animal protein and hypercalciuria, um, any net acid excretion, uh, increase in net acid excretion also promotes hypercalciuria. Um, it's why you might think that, okay, fruits and vegetables, the alkali load, we, this may kind of offset some of the uh, negative effect when you're eating animal protein, but it's not the only reason that animal protein causes hypercalciuria. There's actually a, another study, Naeem Malouf out of UT Southwestern, uh, they corrected uh, the acid load with potassium citrate from animal protein, but there is still an increase in, in calciuria. So there's other mechanisms in addition to the acid load, such as uh, increased filtration or maybe an increased absorption from the GI tract. So what's recommended, that, you know, even though you, you're hearing that animal protein seems to not be great for stone formers, protein is good in general, and we don't want people to have a low protein diet. I think that, that would be a bad thing. But the recommendation, if, the, if someone wants numbers, you want numbers, is around 0.8 to one gram per kilogram of weight. Okay, and so the take home for hypercalciuria is that there are many dietary approaches to reducing the urinary calcium before you say have to start a thiazide medication. The, the two on the left, sugar and salt, there's, there's almost no benef health benefit from eating, eating a lot of this. So I think these are kind of the ones to, to really kind of focus on a little bit would be low salt, low sugar. But you want to also make sure they're not taking calcium supplements um, different than just calcium-based foods. Um, and then the sushi just looked really good. So I, I put that there because the, the other animal protein pictures I saw were a bunch of like raw, raw beef. So, uh, but moderation of animal protein. And so if, so this, I, you know, I, I, this is just an, an app, my fitness pal. Um, again, I have no disclosures, but this, my, our stone dietitian told me about this. And the reason um, I think this is really helpful as a resource is that if you asked me, you know, hey, how much calcium do you eat? I, I would have no idea. Or how much sodium do you eat? I have no idea. Um, but this, well, it says here on the advertisement, over 6 million foods in the database. And, and you, can, you can just pick anything. You go to Starbucks and you order whatever breakfast sandwich or you're at Applebee's and uh, you order something, you can look up almost anything. You can even just look up kale, for example, and you're gonna get calcium and you're gonna get sodium. You're gonna get a lot of things, but important to stones, this can give you kind of an idea to get a sense of, oh wow, this is really adding up the sodium that I'm eating. Okay, so the final thing that we're talking when we think about the kidney stone diet, and there's a reason I put this last, uh, oxalate, as we'll talk about, um, but well, first we'll just kind of refresh, you know, hyperoxaluria. You can have enteric hyperoxaluria, um, which could be associated with malabsorption disorders, like we, we talked about, Crohn's disease, bariatric surgery, such as Ruin Y. Um, and the, and the, the mechanism is that these malabsorbed fatty acids, they kind of mop up the calcium. So the, now there's, there's no calcium to bind the oxalate in the gut. So now you have this unopposed oxalate that gets absorbed. But more commonly is, is you know, dietary hyperoxaluria. There are, you know, there are some foods that are pretty, pretty high in oxalate that we might want to just kind of screen depending on what their stone type is and depending on what their 24-hour urine is. But remember, if you restrict calcium, calcium controls urine oxalate. So if you restrict calcium, uh, you're going to increase your, your urinary oxalate. And so we'll talk more about oxalate, but the, the guideline statement for, for completeness says that if you have calcium oxalate stones and you have hyperoxaluria, limit oxalate rich foods, but importantly, continue to eat dietary calcium. All right, so why do I, why do I put it last? Well, I think for one, it's the most complicated dietary risk factor, um, depending on the solubility of oxalate or whether it's insoluble, the absorption variation from, from, from person to person, the gut microbiome, how much oxalobacter do you have, and does that get upregulated if you eat more oxalate? And, and, and really, there's limited data efficacy of a low oxalate diet for stones. 
Uh, and again, I'm going to say this a couple more times. Fruits and vegetables contain oxalate. They're associated with a lower stone risk. So when talking about oxalate, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the DASH diet. So the DASH diet is the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. Um, and I got this off the NIH website, but if you kind of look at this broadly, you can say that, wow, this is a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about. So um, kind of low, you know, low meat, lots of fruits and vegetables, um, not worrying about calcium, eating dairy products, as well as what the, ca the calcium and other foods like vegetables and fruit, low sodium, low sugar. So, okay, that, that looks pretty good. Um, and so it's been studied. There's two studies I'll mention. The first one is a randomized controlled trial. They studied patients with calcium oxalate stones and hyperoxaluria. So the guideline statement here would have told us they need a low oxalate diet. These are the patients that need a low oxalate diet. Um, and so their primary endpoint was supersaturation. It was a short-term study. Uh, so they looked at calcium oxalate supersaturation, 20 patients in each arm, essentially. And what you found is that the supersaturation of calcium oxalate actually decreased more if you're on the DASH diet. And that's despite eating twice as much oxalate. So these are patients with hyperoxaluria, and you're, you're telling them, well, they're eating twice as much oxalate now, but their supersaturation is actually less they did have a greater calcium intake. So that was probably very important there. The other study is, is uh, by also Gary Curran and colleagues, Eric Taylor, um, but observational study that assigned a DASH score uh, to, uh, to patients based on what they're eating. And so when they compared those who ate in the highest quintile, so basically those who ate the most like a DASH diet, compare those to those that ate the least like a DASH diet, there was a 40 to 45% decreased risk of forming kidney stones. So this is no longer supersaturation. This is actually forming stones. And this applied to all three cohorts that they studied, which included men and women. So, my, so the oxalate musing that I guess I have is that if we, if we only got oxalate through pill form, then it would be a no-brainer we just don't eat that pill, there'd be no reason. But we don't eat a piece of oxalate, we, we eat food. And you know, saying it again, eating fruits and vegetables which contain oxalate lower stone risk because they provide this alkali load which in increases citrate, but also can offset some of the negative lithogenic effects of acid loads. And as we also talked about, eating calcium foods will lower urine oxalate, but also has a beneficial effect of improving bone mineral density. So. Really, I think one of, the, you know, one of the biggest points of this talk is, is really to be, be balanced. Um, you know, balance out you know, foods, make, make healthy kind of uh, decisions when eating in general. So if I say, okay, is there a kidney stone diet? Or if a, if a person asks me, maybe it is the DASH diet. At least, at least a, a lot of the components of the DASH diet seem to be uh, very stone friendly because they're, they're cardiovascular uh, friendly. Um, and as you kind of think about what are stones associated with, they're associated with a lot of comorbid disease like cardiovascular disease. And so uh, we'll kind of finish the last part of the talk here. You know, what could we do better? Um, and this is not going to be, a, this is not going to be an exhaustive list of what we could do better, all things stones. But I, I, reflecting back is what we just talked about. You know, kidney stones are associated with all of these diseases listed here. Um, and a lot of these diseases can be controlled, if not prevented, with dietary change and exercise. Um, and so what do we need to do? Um, not saying I know how to do this or this would be easy, but really a comprehensive dietary modification. And what, you know, whether that's some behavioral intervention to improve dietary choices in general and lifestyle modifications uh, may be the most impactful if we could kind of strip down and start, start from the beginning. And so in, in discussing this or kind of conceptualizing this, um, I wanted to kind of end with talking a little bit about uh, a stone prevention clinical trial. Uh, you may have heard that the USDRN is the um, Urinary Stone Disease Research Network. The trial is prevention of urinary stones with hydration called PUSH. It's ongoing right now. But a little bit about this trial, or, or first the network. The network, there's four clinical, well, six clinical centers 
There's a scientific data research center, and this is, um, has oversight of NIH and IDDK. And when the um, request for application went out a few years ago, there were three aims, but we'll just talk about one aim. They wanted us to design and conduct a randomized controlled trial to investigate the impact of increased fluid intake on the rate of stone recurrence. Um, and you may say, well, there was that one randomized controlled trial before, but a small study uh, with, with uh, some limitations. The American College of Physicians guideline uh, regarding fluid int intake, they, they actually recommend that patients should drink enough to make two liters, but they say the evidence is very weak. But when, we, when, when the awardees of this grant came together uh, to uh, write a protocol, one thing came up. It's like, okay, what's, what's the biggest problem? We could, we could do a randomized controlled trial to try to look at is two liters or two and a half liters different, but really the problem seems to be adherence. You know, that, that's critical for kind of for long-term uh, stone prevention. And, but how do you actually change the behavior and get someone to be adherent with some, something different? Because, you know, these are, you know, the pictures, you know, on the right, or these, the, when you tell someone to drink more fluids or they're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been, I'm getting ready to do that. I'm, it's going to be great. I just had a bad stone. I'm going to increase fluids now. Uh, but then the next time you see them, like, oh, you know, I, I did that for a few weeks and yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm still not doing it. So, how do you change the behavior? And that's what we started to focus on with this trial. So we looked at behavioral economics approaches um, to, to see, can you improve adherence? Um, and it's been shown in things like weight loss or smoking cessation. Financial incentives um, have been shown to help uh, uh, produce new habits. They can overcome this present day bias. And so it's, it's really hard for someone to say, I'm gonna make this change now because it might affect me three years from now or five years from now. It's really hard for people to, to kind of make that change because of that. But financial incentives can, can potentially help. Structured problem solving. This has been shown to help with medication adherence. This is essentially talking to a coach, you know, identifying a problem, coming up with solutions, and then the patient deciding you know, what the best plan of action is, what seems reasonable for them, and then review progress. And so the pri there's, there's several hypotheses. The primary hypothesis of, of this study is that a program of behavioral intervention to increase fluid intake will reduce the risk of stone disease recurrence versus usual care. We didn't wanna randomize patients uh, to not drinking much fluids. We wanted to randomize patients to a behavioral intervention to the standard of care, which is you know, telling them to drink enough to make two and a half liters as the guideline statement says. Um, so it's a randomized trial, there's pragmatic features. Um, we talked about two arms, it's a two year study with the primary outcome of uh, symptomatic stone recurrence. And um, if you've heard of this trial, you might, have, you might think or have heard, oh, this is the smart water bottle study. Um, it's not, we're not really, studying the smart water bottle, we, it is used as a study platform uh, for the intervention arm because those patients actually get a fluid prescription uh, based on their 24-hour urine deficit. And so that's how they're tracked and they get their financial incentive if they're meeting their, their daily goal. Uh, but it is kind of a catchy thing is the smart water bottle and, and piques people's interest. But the first year, we're really trying to form new habits and that's the financial incentives. Um, if they're not adherent, they roll into the structured problem solving. The second year, you're trying to sustain habits. Financial incentives are tapered, and then they roll into um, kind of what we call low-touch interventions based on patient choice, which could be text reminders, or it could be them watching their patient testimonial that described their initial stone event, uh, which was painful. Okay, so, um, you know, the... You know, overall, the, what we hope the contribution to science will be uh, is that evidence of a behavioral change program can increase fluid intake, which is a surrogate for stone formation, but also modify the health outcome, which is stone recurrence. We also hope that it can generate some evidence to support fluid intake, uh, those recommendations. And so I'll finish the, the last uh, two slides um, kind of summarizing 
what we talked about, you know, we went over in detail the evaluation guidelines, discussed, you know, what the screening evaluation should be and, and who should get a complete evaluation. Um, we, we really kind of focused on dietary guidelines. We talked about the guideline statements, but went a little further in uh, the evidence of these various components of diet and how they affect really a lot of the guideline statements. Um, and healthy diet is, is, seems to be kidney stone healthy. I do think that behavioral interventions, although difficult, can, can be the most impactful from a population health standpoint because you know, if you knew nothing else about someone's kidney stone history, their 24-hour urine, uh, their stone, almost everyone would benefit from empiric recommendations. And that would be increasing fluids, low salt, low sugar, eat calcium foods, eat fruits and vegetables, maybe avoid really high protein diet, and then exercise. I think, you know, if, from a population health standpoint, patients would benefit, stone patients would benefit if you knew nothing else. Um, and with that, uh, I think that goes on my last slide. So uh, thanks. Um, I'd say thanks for your attention. I assume you're, you're, uh, I had your attention, but... Um, I was paying attention. Oh, good, good. Yeah. So I guess well, any questions that uh, that we have we want to go over? Yeah, we have some great questions. Thank you, first of all, for that really great comprehensive overview. I think it's really important to hear about kind of the primary literature to, to find out where these guidelines come from. And in fact, there's a lot more research to be done in this area, and it's really kind of understudied. Um, so... I think a lot of the questions were had to do with the 24-hour urines and how you think about those. Um, one that came up that was particularly interesting and certainly something we've come across is how do you think about collecting 24-hour urines in patients that have recurrent stones but have had some sort of urinary diversion or augmentation of their bladder? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a great question. Um, and um, I mean, the, the, the short answer is that I'm not sure how helpful they are. Um, you know, if someone has um, a urinary diversion, especially a continent diversion where the urine is going to sit for a long time uh, with, in, with bowel, um, you're going to get kind of absorption things. I just, I don't know if that is going to be as reflective of what the kidney is is seeing, and so honestly, a lot of the times we actually don't we don't get a twenty four year because we're not sure how it's gonna how it's gonna help us uh, in that case. Um, I mean, an ileal conduit maybe is because uh, there's 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 kind of quicker transit time you know through the conduit being a incontinent uh, diversion. I mean, I guess you know if they had a nephrostomy tube, but they'd have to have bilateral nephrostomy tubes you know maybe that would be more reflective but it, it's a tough population um i don't so I, i'm not saying we don't always get them you know we'll get them some we're just trying to uh, trying to figure out some answers to try to help a patient but a lot of times we're thinking more about their risk factors and, and empiric recommendations and that uh and that those uh patient, difficult patients right um, and then with regards to fluid intake, and this is a question, you know, I think we've come across as well in clinic, you know, the guidelines to tell somebody they should be making 2.5 liters of urine um, isn't exactly, you know, common knowledge in terms of how much you're peeing every day. So what do you generally tell them in terms of what they should be drinking? Yeah, and that's that's exactly right. And so the it, it it's you know these guideline statements that are, that say urine volume. I and I think it's because it's the best that really we can do, and that's what some evidence shows. But um, but it could be wildly different, you know, depending on you know how active someone is, and you know whether they're working outside in construction and or running a marathon, and you know they're going to have so much more insensible losses. But in general, um, you know, it, it tend to tend to say um, you should drink closer to three liters, you know, if we're trying to get, you know, two and a half liters. And, and we, you know, emphasize that it's going to vary. We, we, you know, that's not perfect. Uh, but, you know, starting with eight to 10 glasses of water and then, and then, then it's okay to drink other stuff, coffee, tea, um, you know, that's kind of a, a lofty goal that you can kind of set out for patients uh, that I often will talk about. 
you know, the one thing about, you know, the, the push study that I mentioned is that, you know, we, I think we were the first to, to think about a fluid prescription that was based on urine volume deficit. You know, of course it's a urine volume deficit of one or two 24 hour urines and that can fluctuate, but we're, that's a kind of part of what we were doing with that study is seeing, you know, could that, could that be helpful to actually have an individual fluid prescription, not a total fluid prescription, but, but an additional liter or something based on what their kind of usual standard kind of daily routine is. Yeah, and I think for those recurrent stone formers where we get um, 24-hour urines multiple times, we can kind of see over time they're doing a much better job with hydration and giving that feedback. Whatever you're doing at this time, you've got uh, two to three liters, and that's great. So keep doing that. Um, on uh, that same kind of topic, with the 24-hour urines for recurrent stone formers, do you always get one or two 24-hour uh, urines? How do you think about that guideline that you could, do you think getting two is mandatory? Yeah, so, so I, I, I usually start out with one, you know, thinking that I'm probably going to repeat a 24-hour urine, uh, you know, over, you know, depending on if we're making dietary change or, or, or what, but we're going to re probably repeat one over the next, you know, three to six months in general. And the reason I, I mean, I, if you have two, if you have 48 hours in a row, and, and ideally maybe one that's during the weekday and one that's during the weekend, if you have two, I think, you know, more information, honestly, is, is probably better but it's hard enough to get people to do these 24 hour urines, uh, let alone 48 hours of uh, urine collection. Um, and so really I just want to, I want to get something. And so I usually recommend just, you know, just starting with a tw one 24 hour urine, knowing that it's just a single snapshot um, and just to kind of get that, see if there's any severe abnormalities and then kind of go from there. And if a patient has recurrent stones, um, but you get a 24-hour urine back that's kind of stone cold normal or they're not a particular thing that you target, how do you counsel them? Yeah, so um, that, that's, that, so that, that I think is kind of part of the, uh, what we talked about earlier is, is, you know, are people, you know, studying for the test? Um, you know, are you, are they, or do they normally really just make a liter of urine a day or 1200 and they, they use that one day uh, to, you know, to drink enough where everything looks pretty normal. It's like, oh, wow, you're doing great. Two liters of urine, you know, that looks good. But that's really not what seven days a week, what, what their kidneys are seeing. So that's, that's, that's one, one thing that, you know, I try to actually say, did this reflect, did this, is this what you normally did? Um, or do you eat, you know, just, high salt meal every day and then you decided not to do it that day because you know it's probably not good. So I kind of have to delve into that a little bit. Now if they if you if you get the sense that um, they, this is was really pretty accurate um, and if they have active stones and the 24 hour urines are looking pretty normal each time, you can actually start them on a medication. There is a guideline statement uh, a pharmacologic, uh, you know, we didn't talk about those today, but there is a guideline statement that starting potassium citrate uh, or thiazide actually is, is in the guideline statements that you can do for someone with bland or normal 24-hour urines, but recurrent calcium or recurrent stone formers. Um, so sometimes it's rare, actually, that I'll just start a medication with, uh, with stone cold normal 24-hour urines. Uh, but I think that that is, that is uh, an option. But I think also what I would emphasize first is that you continue to counsel them on those empiric dietary recommendations because, you know, it, you're, you're, you're likely to, to, to help them in some way or, or then they realize, oh, okay, I'm not supposed to decrease my dietary calcium you know, just continue to talk about the importance of some of those uh, recommendations. And then, you know, hopefully with each time, something else kind of gets through. Great. Um, and for patients that are on um, different supplements or vitamins, I think, you know, two of the most common ones we see are vitamin C um, and vitamin D. What do you tell them to do with regards to continuing those or stopping them? Yeah, vi vitamin D, especially, um, I mean, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, everyone is taking vitamin D. Um, 
so vitamin D, uh, I, so, so my practice is typically if they're taking less than 2000 or, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay with that, but I do ask them or say, have you had your vitamin D checked? Because a lot of times what happens is that people are taking, they've never had it checked, they're not low, um, or they've had a check and they're actually high, they're higher than normal. Uh, and they're taking 5,000 international units a day. I will want, I want them to, kind of, to decrease that to get into a normal range. So, um, you know, you don't want, there are some stone formers that, that they react um, a lot differently to vitamin D is for, probably because of increasing absorption of calcium. Um, just like patients who have hypercalciuria, idiopathic hypercalciuria, they respond differently to sodium load. So their calcium goes up a lot higher uh, from sodium loads than say a non-stone former. There's, there's uh, evidence of that for whatever reason. So there are some people who are hyper responders is probably not a great word, but, but respond differently with their vitamin D that is in increasing their urinary calcium. But in general for vitamin D, I say, okay, 2000 or less is probably fine a day, uh, unless your vitamin D is high. replace it into the normal range uh, and then vitamin c i basically usually say there's no reason to really take supplemental um, vitamin c so i tend to tell them because of the effects on oxalate urinary oxalate i say usually stop the vitamin c Martin, do you know you know there's increasing um, artificial meats and, and uh, meat substitutes that are high in vegetable proteins. Is there a big difference there in terms of your risk factors? Yeah. So, um, so, so the the so in general, it, it's it's thought that animal protein, from a stone perspective, is worse than you know uh, vegetable protein. And I you know my understanding is that is is really because of the acid load. So we talked about the acid load and, and its effects on, on various components of, uh, in the urinary analytes. Um, the animal protein in, in the form um, is, um, it, no, or say non-dairy animal protein is the biggest acid load. If like dairy protein, say milk, for example, is really neutral. Um, and then you have vegetable protein, which is, is, is not an acid load, it's, the, it's more like alkali load. And so that, I think, is, is why vegetable protein, um, from a stone perspective, is better than an animal protein. Um, and you also talked about different kinds of beverages. I think the main takeaway was that as long as they weren't overloaded with sugar or um, that they were either neutral or, or beneficial in stone risk. Um, I think a question that we get a lot is whether mineral water or sparkling water has, has uh, worse effects than just regular tap water. Yeah, I, so I, I, I don't know of any, um, any evidence that, that uh, uh, in regards to mineral water as being a problem. I mean, I, 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 I tend to say, I did, you know, kind of going down back to the, I just want them drinking fluids and, you know, um, and so I'm fine with mineral water. There, 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 I think in, in Campbell's, there's something about, you know, um, there's something about some weak evidence of uh, mineral uh, in, in water and whether that can affect stones, but the, really nothing has, has reached any guideline statements. Um, and so I'm fine because again, a lot of people don't like water, but they might like fizzy water or mineral water. So I say, yes, drink it. That's fine. I wouldn't worry about that. I'd rather you be producing more urine. Um, the, you know, the, the, in, the interesting, we talked about the, the show, the one study about sugar uh, and increasing urinary calcium. Uh, there's also evidence that a sugar load, not only does it increase urine calcium, for whatever reason, it increases urinary oxalate and uric acid. And so, you know, I didn't get into all that kind of uh, data, but it, it's just, you know, the, these, you know, something like sugar, it seems to affect a lot of components of, of, uh, of stone uh, disease. All right. Well, great. Thank you very much. I think that was the main questions and uh, hopefully everyone's staying hydrated while they're under quarantine. And uh, thanks again for all the information. All right. Thanks a lot. Hope everyone got something out of that. Take care.